Thank you. Can you guys hear me all right? Mics are okay? I'm wearing two mics today. One for the video here and then one for the room. So let me know if I need to, to, to speak up. Um, yeah, I like to run up to the front, <laughs> uh, especially in the morning. Um, how many people are here for the first time, first creative mornings? Nice, awesome. This is my first creative morning. No bullshit. Uh, <laughs> And the funny thing is, we've hosted them at Gravity Tank um, in the past, and I was traveling, and I didn't get to go. Um, so this is my first one. Kind of feel like a jerk, because it's the one that I'm speaking at. Um, uh, but let's get, let's, let's get into it. So um, this notion of empathy, I'm louder when I'm not looking at you. Did you notice that? I'll just <laughs> deliver the rest of it like this. Um, so this, this idea of empathy is a big piece of, of Gravity Tank's work. Um, and has become a big part of the way I, th I view the world. Uh, and so I'm excited to be here and share that with you guys. Um, and the times three is this idea that um, I think we talk mostly about empathy for end users, right? Better understanding our audience so we can design better things for them. Um, and that's true and that's good and we'll, we'll spend some time there. But uh, I also want to talk about empathy for clients um, and empathy for our teammates because I think Kind of the combination of those three make for a pretty um, fulfilling, meaningful uh, life full of connections. Um, okay, so all of the feels, right? Whoa, did you see that? That was like echo effect. <coughs> so, um, hello, my name is Antonio. Uh, here's my big dumb face again. Um, you already know that I work at Gravity Tank. One, one slide about it. Um, 71 people, we have an office here in Chicago, that's sort of headquarters, and a small office in San Francisco. Um, and we combine three disciplines and are served by operations, who kind of keeps the thing afloat. Um, and those disciplines are research, design, and strategy. And, and before Gravity Tank, those were the things that I really wanted as part of uh, inputs to the work that I made. And prior to Gravity Tank, I never, I never had access to researchers uh, and research findings and insights and I didn't have uh, a strategic objective to my designs. I wasn't thinking about uh, business. I was designing purely with aesthetics and kind of um, communication in mind, kind of design light. Um, and it was here that, um, that I just saw the value of adding those, those other um, points of view to my work. Um, and a big piece of that is empathy, because if you've been, who's been to Gravity Tank? Anybody? A few people? If you've seen the space that we work, it's like this, right? It, nobody has offices. You don't go close the, you know, the door and get to work. You're in these open spaces, highly collaborative. And you can't work with this many people on a project for three months at a time. Uh, we have the luxury of being able to, to focus on a project uh, as a designer and not split ourselves between multiple accounts and a bunch of other things, right? Um, but you can't do that without having empathy, a profound you know, amount of empathy because uh, it's too close. You're, you know, the proximity you have shoulder to shoulder with people, um, y you need to, to sort of see yourself in others um, to not go crazy and strangle, you know, someone next to you. Um, so, yeah. Um, just as kind of like baseline setup, digging in and unpacking the, the term empathy, um, so we're all on the same page. I have a video uh, and, and I'll show that to you now. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. 
Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. (laughs) Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. (laughs) John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So we can start the (laughs) Q&A. I'm done. Um, right? She summed it up really well. I don't really have anything to build on that, so I want to kind of talk about that as it applies to our work as designers, because that was sort of empathy, you know, all caps empathy, um, <clears throat> and, uh, and spend a little bit of time there. But I also have tension myositis syndrome, and if I don't express feelings, actually I feel physical pain in my body. Everybody has this, actually. Um, and, and, and so if I subvert feelings, um, I end up like, you know, having like a neck spasm or waking up feeling like, oh, weird. And so if I, if I get a little like emotional or teary while I present, just know that that's what that is. So, um, <clears throat> all right. This, uh, this idea of, uh, of empathy is feeling with people, Dr. Brene Brown said. I love that. And if you haven't uh, seen her TED talk on vulnerability, you should, he's nodding, he's seen it, right? Did you cry? I cried. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's just, it's about that thing that we don't talk about because crying at work, right? Like you just, <laughs> you don't do that. Um, but it's, it's really powerful and I think they're, they're connected, this notion of vulnerability and empathy. <clears throat> Anyways, the work that she referenced though was not her own, it was Teresa Wiseman's. Um, and, and just to kind of highlight off what, what she had said, these four qualities of empathy. That guy's not being very empathetic. Looks like his girlfriend's sad and he doesn't care at all. Um, so perspective taking, right, that little sad face that he pulled down from the cloud, staying out of judgment, which is tough for us as, as critical uh, designers, we're, we're awesome at that. Um, <clears throat> recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that recognition. Uh, so kind of keep those four qualities in mind uh, as, we, as we chat through this. All right. Um, and just to sort of tie it to, you know, make it as hyper relevant and, um, you know, straight out of the headlines as possible. Um, Who saw this post, uh, right, Um, that Facebook was going to add the dislike button, right? And the main reason that uh, that Mark Zuckerberg talked about doing it, just like it says here, uh, was to allow people to express empathy, right? Someone posts something really sad and you want to say, I feel for you, but you're just like, sorry your dog died. Like, it's just, it's weird, (laughs) you know? Like, and so this is like, yes, I, I feel, you know, um, I feel bad with you about this and I, and I, and I have a, a sense of how you're feeling. Um, so that's a big deal, right? Like, they've been talking about this button forever. Um, and then, you know, I gotta put, uh, I gotta put someone on blast um, and I hope uh, 
that they see why I did it. But um, uh, so that was that was Facebook. This is Twitter. Um, <coughs> in preparing for this, and, and you know, you guys are all there with your finger on the uh, the button at you know 10:59 or whatever to get tickets, <laughs> and uh, and someone had tweeted that they couldn't get tickets, um, and they were they were pissed. Like I think rightfully, you know, so right. Like it sounded like this wasn't the first time that they couldn't get tickets, and so she tweeted at the at the conference and at me about it, um, and she was she was pissed, and and I got it, and in that moment I thought, well, you know, it's technology failed, maybe something wasn't communicated well, um, and I just replied as honestly as I could, or as I didn't take offense, I don't have any control over it, it wasn't like there's a secret cabal of people blocking her IP address, keeping her from getting tickets, but in that moment she felt like that, it was like, god damn it, like I wanted to go to this, I wanted to go before, what's going on guys, right? <clears throat> so this is how it unfolded, uh, if you can't read it. Uh, get a ticket for our next Creative Morning, tickets released at 11 a.m. At Chicago CM, at AM Garcia, the website is always jammed, and then I'm waitlisted. Worse than getting Lala tickets, find inspiration elsewhere. And she was ready to bounce. <laughs> and I saw this, and I was walking down the street, and I was like, oh, God. And I said, as an interaction designer, like, I fully get uh, when tech gets in the way of a human connection, right? And, and if you want to talk about empathy one on one, happy to do it. Like, we don't have to do it at this thing. We could do it in a Google Hangout, right? And then, th you know, Minutes later, I'm off the wait list. Looking forward to your talk on Friday. Bringing team members, creative faith renewed. <laughs> I was like, the power of empathy, right? And, and getting tickets to, to something you want to go to. Um, and, you know, I just had to top it off with, you know, nice, glad it worked out, I'll see you Friday. Are you here? Are, did you? You are, awesome. <laughs> Give it up for her. Amy, thank you. Um, great, I'm glad you're here too. Um, okay, so, um, and, and, and you know, in a, in a very meta way, when I was asked to do this, um, you sent me like a six page little, like, like this awesome primer for how to not suck if you come up here and you deliver content. And it's, it's so that I do a good job, it's so that you have a good experience. Like that was a little, you know, empathy primer. Like here's the things that people are expecting when they get here. Here's the sort of people that come. Do this, don't do that. Like that wasn't there as rules to behave. That was like, you know, be empathetic for the 175 people and the 300 people on the wait list. Like don't get up here and deliver something not awesome. Um, and so I took that seriously. And, uh, and so this notion that experience builds empathy, we have to kind of, see and experience um, things with other people to develop that empathy. And it <coughs> in design, it, it kind of plays out like this, right? The guy's got an arrow in his butt. <laughs> Not unlike the, the, the other animation that we just watched. Um, and, and we want to move to this, like figuratively or truly experiencing the thing uh, that someone else has. Um, and so just quick read of the room so we know how deep to go in any of this. Uh, who spends a lot of time with users in, in the design work that they do? Just show of hands. Yeah, not awesome ratio. Uh, and, and maybe you're doing it through uh, usability testing or surveys or you're interviewing people or you're going out in the world, you know, doing ethnographic research. Um, and if you're not, which I wasn't prior to Gravity Tank, you always feel like you're guessing or you're executing the creative brief and you didn't have any say in this thing, I, okay, I'll make that web banner say that thing or whatever, right? But you're like, is that even what people want? I don't know. And it's a shitty way to design. Um, it's not very fulfilling. And so pushing for that in your practice and saying like, no, I actually want to go spend time with people. Even if it's not authorized by the project, I'm gonna go interview people on my own. Awesome. So let's, let's dig into what that looks like. <coughs> so I said, um, you know, we're gonna talk about uh, empathy applied to end users, clients, and teammates. Yeah? This is, um, this is the start, number one. Uh, I think people now more than ever with like all of the technology and messaging that they're pumped full of every day, on average, I would say most people's mind is just make me care. Like I'm flooded with all of this stuff. Demonstrate some reason why this product 
is worth my attention or why I should care at all about this or whatever it is, right? And so if your goal is to make people care about something and to sort of bring about change or you know, provoke a transaction or a reaction in something, um, then it can't just be communication design. It has to be resonant. It has to speak to something inside of that person where they see themselves in that product or that experience or that service and they go, yes, I want more of that. Um, and a lot of times, and kind of historically, we've relied on demographics, kind of marketing segments, segmentation studies. Um, and demographics, that's like designing against the census. Like, it, I don't know if you said, you know, African-American women who make over $100,000 a year, uh, 25 to 30. Oh, okay, what do I design for that person? I don't know what that person likes. I don't know what keeps them up at night. I don't know what drives their decisions. I don't know what their ambitions are. I've got these data points. Like I can't do anything with demographics. Um, but psychographics are a totally different thing. Psychographics are those things. They are needs and desires and values and the things that keep people up at night and the things that get them excited to go into work. And you have to tap into those to make something that speaks to somebody. Um, and so ethnographic research is an approach for that. It's, I won't get into the history, but it's, it's born out of anthropology and ethnography. And when it's applied to design, you get really meaningful results because you go spend time with people where they are, where the action is happening, uh, observational um, or, or in conversation with people. And it's just a very authentic way to get smart about stuff. Um, and you get out from behind the mirrored glass of the stupid group survey space and you just you spend time with people. The same way you get to know your friends, you go get to know end users, right? Um, and it's this notion of two-way expertise. Like businesses don't do it because they, you know, lots of businesses do it now. But a business's um, hesitance to do it is because the business is the expert. The business makes the product. The business understands the features. They know the functionality. Uh, and the people, the people just need to be told what to go buy, right? And it's this notion of two-way expertise. Like, no, those people are experts in their own lives. And they have something to say about the experiences they want. And we should be listening. Um, and so, you know, if, you know, that, that description that design is, you know, to design a design that produces a design, like, if we want to make things that, that provoke and resonate with people, those are designed. That we have an outcome in mind that we want to have happen and we have to understand the inputs into it. It's, uh, there's application broadly for what, for what we're about. So, designing for resonance, yes. You know, making something that speaks to somebody. We know this is important. Um, psychographics are always better than demographics. Truly understand a, a user, their journey, um, making meaning for people with the stuff that we create, and, and the value of ethnographic research. Um, there's not much more to say about it when, it when we're talking about, about end users. It's pretty straightforward, right? I want to make something, and I want to do it informed, and I want it to matter. Um, so that's where empathy plays for for that group of people. Um, and if you're like, well, I don't have a researcher on my team, or we don't have a budget to go do that. Like, that sounds awesome. I'd love that, but I, we, don't, we don't do that at my studio or at my agency or whatever. Then partner with people who do do it and use their expertise and find someone that, uh, that you trust in the space. And they don't even necessarily have to be full-time team members. Gravity Tank built a tool uh, a couple years back uh, called DScout, a mobile research tool. It spun out its own startup. But it's basically using the behaviors that we already do, right? We post on Instagram, we comment on stuff, we make little videos and shoot selfies. And it said, let's just take those behaviors that people are already, most people, pretty comfortable doing, and let's just add a layer of research. Let's add a layer of why behind this stuff. And so we send people out on missions with their phone and the app to just document life and report back. And the missions are pretty specific, and we ask them a few questions after they've posted something. But there's tools like this, and it's not just ours. I'm not up here to promote this. Um, M4, the letter M, F-O-U-R, is another one. Um, and Instant Census is like a text messaging survey um, that doesn't feel like a uh, survey. It feels like you're texting with a, with a friend, because you are. There's like another human on the other end of it. Um, so if you want like cheaper, quick data, use inputs like this. If you want to partner with people, team up with the Institute of Design. Use students from that program. Use students from the social behavior uh, uh, college at uh, the University of Chicago. Um, or if you want to kind of, you know, use another agency and partner at that level, uh, Survey Center Focus 
as a, as a place that could help you recruit people, you know? Um, or Watch Lab also. Shout out uh, to Jen Schiffman, who leads our research team at Gravity Think and pretty much gave me that slide. Um, and then someone earlier uh, on the break had asked, like, are there just good books, kind of primers, reads that I should have? Yes, these, these two have been helpful to me. Um, tall shout out to Aaron Scheimer back in the Firebelly days. He brought this design research book to the office and he, and he tabbed the shit out of it. <laughs> He's like, we should read all of these chapters and then we should do something about it. Um, and he bought a book for everybody, which I thought was really kind. Um, so I still have that book. I still have his tabs in there. Um, and then that 100 Things, it's kind of from a UX standpoint, but, um, but a super valuable book, looking at the behavioral, neurological, psychological, goofy things that humans do, why they do them, and then how you can design for those and, uh, and, and make affordances for those. And I think she now has like 100 more things, um, you know, because we're complex. Um, okay, so number two. Moving right along. Um, this notion of empathy for clients. What? <laughs> clients, no. They're the least empathetic. You know, make my logo bigger. How, how do I reply to that? Um, right, like, it's kind of an us versus them feeling a lot of times, right? Or you get this shitty secondhand critique from a project manager, no offense to project managers, but you're like, oh, I just want to talk to the client directly. Can I do that? Why do we have to play telephone? This is crazy. I'm designing for things that they're trying to get done, and we don't talk. We don't talk about what they want done. I got this brief or this whatever, like, get out from under the brief. Um, have, have conversations with your clients. They're just people trying to do shit. And so are you, right? So um, understanding their business. You know. Uh, when I was uh, a younger designer, I would sort of work on that piece, the thing that you know, was assigned to me or, or the, the project. And I never thought about it in the context of the larger thing that this organization, this foundation, this enterprise was trying to do. I didn't care. I don't know. I was ignorant. I didn't, I didn't dig in and say, like, what are the other factors going on in this person's industry that's freaking them out? And this, this project is just a tiny little drop in what they're trying to do. Um, or the, the situation that they're facing as, a, as, a, as an organization in this, this space, this landscape, wherever it is. And to truly spend time doing that takes rigor, and not everybody's into it. People are like, you know what? I just want to design. I'm not going to read the Wall Street Journal. And I'm not saying that you need to, but I'm just saying having a sense of what's going on is going to inform while, while your clients make seemingly irrational decisions and say dumb stuff. Um, because they've got a whole other world of things going on that have nothing to do with your project, that when you understood them, you might, you might have a better angle. You might actually say, like, why are we doing this? You know, I just met with you and you're talking about this, and this is not in service of that objective you have. Like, what if we pumped the brakes on this and we actually did this instead? And now what you've moved from is likable order taker to trusted advisor, because you gave a shit, because you dug in a little bit deeper than the assignment to say, I think I've got an angle on your business. It's not like you're going to solve their business. No one's going to know the client's business better than the client. But you could at least have a conversation, shared vocabulary. Hey, I read this thing. I saw this thing. I think it impacts your business. Let me forward you this article. Whatever. It's, it's client management to a degree, but it's caring about the stuff that's stressing them out. Uh, and I think you'll be surprised um, at how they receive that kind of um, input. Um, so stakeholder interviews are a really good way to do this. Usually you've got like a little, you've got a project kickoff and you meet with the client and then you might not see them for weeks or months or something while you toil away in the darkness for the big reveal later. And that's like the worst way to work because they weren't part of any of that process. They didn't, they didn't hear any of it. They just sort of, maybe they got little incremental blips and they saw the final thing and they have no idea how you got there. And so they're instantly like this about it because they weren't part of it. And they didn't see it take shape. And so stakeholder interviews, and not just with like your direct client, but maybe like other people that this work is going to impact in the organization. Push for that. Like, I know this isn't a, an IT project, but ultimately someone's going to have to implement it. Can we talk to somebody in that group? Just, to, just so I know what I'm doing is going to be useful. Um, you know, I had a client tell me that the project that he was working on would decide his career. And I thought like, that's a ton of unnecessary pressure. Why did you say that to me? <laughs> but he was totally serious. And I, and I was like, 
oh, he wasn't just being you know, facetious. He was, he was totally serious. Like he had, he had basically pushed to the highest level within his organization that they needed to have a UX group internally. And they said, well, demonstrate it with a project. And so this was the project. And he was teaming up with an external person to get the project done to demonstrate, like, look, we should stop paying people like this to do it. We should do it in-house. In and, um, and so his job really was on it. Like, if this project failed, I don't think he would get fired, but he wouldn't get what he wanted. And he probably wouldn't be, you know, SVP of user experience at uh, uh, a SaaS product that has like 18 million users, right? They would have been like, nah, dude, we'll just keep this development centric mindset we have. So anyways, understanding that the external and internal pressures that your clients have is, is, is a good way to build empathy for them. Um, Social contracting, has anyone heard of this? Uh, you guys know the 99U series, those three little books that they've, they've put out? It's mentioned there. If you search um, Harvard Business Review, there's a great little article on social contracting for teams. Um, but it's just this notion of being like really honest, uh, upfront about what can go wrong on a project with the people who will be impacted by that. And we don't tend to do that, because like, we don't tend to do that. We, uh, we, 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 we go best case scenario. Right? We've got a timeline, we've got a budget, we've got a bunch of activities, we're going to finish the product, it's going to be great. But that never happens. When has that ever happened? Without some hiccup, or without some delay, or without like, hey, we're going to need an extension, we need more money, or whatever. Like, it never, ever, ever, ever goes smoothly. And so to just have an honest conversation about like, hey, what happens when this goes over deadline? Not because I, I'm going to do that on purpose, but it will happen. Let's talk about it now while we're calm and the project's barely started, then like way late when you're freaking out. Right? It's going to be more conducive conversation earlier. Um, and just kind of treating clients as <laughs> authentic human beings, um, a, as hard as that may be. Um, and, uh, yeah. and so then the last thing is just pulling back the curtain on your process, letting them in. And it's like, no, I don't want all their feedback. We're not ready for that. Like, I want them to see it when it's perfect. That's the worst time for them to look at it, because you think it's perfect, and they haven't seen it until just now, and I guarantee you they're not going to be like, I love it. Put it on everything. <laughs> they're going to ask you a bunch of questions about it, like, how, why, where did this blue come from, or whatever. And you're, you're going to defend it like you did in art school, and you're going to have this, like, let me tell you about design, guys. And you're going to break it all down for them, and they're going to be like, yeah, you're, that's not our business. You know, this blue is not our business. And you're going to be like, what? I don't even understand what that means. But you have to. You have to strive to understand what that means. Why are they saying blue isn't their business? Dig deeper into that. Say more about that, Fred. What do you mean blue is not your business? Let him tell you. Give him space to give critique. Clients don't know how to give critique. They, didn't, they went their MBAs or whatever. They're executive directors from foundations. They didn't learn how to talk meaningfully about anything creative. So help them. Give them a vocabulary to do that. All right. And I know it's going to feel hard. It's going to feel like this. Right? <laughs> you know, you might, you might feel that way, that, like, you don't understand my clients, Antonio. They are this. This is how much they care about the stuff that I'm working on, which sucks. That's a horrible feeling to know that, you know? Um, so this is a, a, a presentation about how to get out from under these sorts of accounts. Um, but it's the reality of this. Like you might really feel that going in, and I, and I think that it requires uh, you to recognize the ask. You know, what are we trying to do, and is it truly meeting objectives? Maybe they didn't even express what those were. Trying to build bridges, trying to practice your aim, and make sure that like you're using the right tools for the job, and you're thinking about this, you know, with maturity and perspective. Um, trying to use a vocabulary that non-designers use, because we know like. Most of the time, we're not creating something for ourselves, right? We're not making stuff for other designers. Unless you're doing like, you know, hand lettering or something beautiful that we can appreciate aesthetically, you're working on a product that non-designers are going to use or non-designers are going to read or interpret. And so to think like a non-designer is hard. You got to get out from the studio and go spend time. Um, so yeah, establishing a point of view, leading this change. Um, it's hard work, and you won't do it overnight. And there'll be some clients that you're like, you know what, Antonio, this doesn't apply. And I agree, it doesn't work. <laughs> like, I'm not going to lie. Um, but do what you can to not take projects on like that. And then, you know, find the, find the bright spots with clients who do get it and make them awesome, 
um, advocates for design in their organization. All right, last one. Uh, and I think the most important one. But it's, um, it's empathy for teammates. And, uh, you know, uh, client work is hard enough as it is. And I don't know that we work actively to make the environment conducive to that hard work. But treating each other with empathy, by understanding our own teammates, um, you're going to spend more time with those people than you might with, like, your partner or other people, right? You're there every day. Um, so <coughs> respect and acknowledge um, your teammates' roles and points of view, you know, your non-designer teammates, um, their contributions to the work. It's about developing a high EQ, a high emotional quotient, uh, this ability to, to um, see yourself in others, like I've said. Um, so uh, recognizing the contributions of other people um, and, and appreciating those for what they are. You don't have to give, you know, take every bit of feedback and put it into play, you know, but you should, you should hear it. Whether you listen to it and apply it is a, is a different thing, but people feel awesome when they feel heard. Um, so this, this idea at Gravity Tank we talk about a lot, strong opinions held loosely, um, because it's the idea that uh, through research or understanding your own personal experience, you could, you could have a lot of conviction for something, you know, feel it true in your heart. I know this is right. And someone's like, well, what about that data point? And you're like, oh, man, right? And they totally deflate it. That's awesome. It's awesome to be able to feel really strongly about it and, and speak about it passionately and make the point, but be totally open to a new point of view that changes your perspective on it and goes, you know, ha I was wrong. That, that, that's actually a really good point. I didn't think about that. Um, and that, that takes humility and vulnerability, and it's hard to do, especially when you work on something you love and you're proud of it and you've been toiling away for weeks on it or whatever. Um, everybody on Dribble loves it. Um, so this idea of the culture of critique and how you foster that, um, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was IDEO or from the D school, but I found this little, this, this three-part phrase, and I think I've actually bastardized its original intent, but I find it a really great way to help people who don't give feedback a lot about creative things, uh, a way to talk about it, a way to frame it. So you might try this in your next critique, especially if there are people there who are not designers. Um, it's very simple. It's I like, I wish, I wonder. Um, and so I like, you know, it's sort of the negative sandwich. Um, I like is like one thing positive that's happening in this that I'm like, yeah, that's good. You know, I like your kerning here, or whatever. <laughs> um, and then uh, I wish, that's like, that's the negative sandwich. That's the negative meat between the positive bread. And that's like, ah, I wish you would have done this, right? Maybe there's still time to do that. But that's, that's your input on like, you know, I wish you would have done this other thing. And then I wonder, like, just opens up the possibilities. So before this design gets all tight and perfect and shipped, I wonder what would happen if you did this. That's not really good or bad. It's just sort of, I'm going to toss this out as another thing. And I think it's just a really nice structure. You can go quickly around. I like, I wish, I wonder, getting feedback. And you know, once you do it once, it's corny, and you outgrow it, and you don't do it again. But like, <laughs> just that as a framing is useful, I think, for people who don't know how to talk about the stuff they're looking at, so that you don't get feedback like, you know, blue is not my business, or whatever. Um, and then this last one is just don't be an asshole. And you know, I think it's easy to conflate empathy with being a pushover, or just being nice. He's really nice. That doesn't mean that that person understands the other person. That just means they're nice, you know? And, and so it's not about being nice. It's about, um, you know, assuming that the people on your team want to contribute to great work. Why is that not our natural inclination? It's like, oh, Tom, he's oh God, got that guy. Lazy ass. Or, or whatever, right? Or like, Sheila, she always turns that shit in late, like way past deadline. Like, what is going on, right? Who knows what's going on in either of those people's lives? When's the last time you grabbed coffee with them or checked in? And I think like mentorship and fellowship and just, you know, when a, when a project starts, super simple. What do you want out of this project? Independent of like the tasks at hand and the creative brief. Like, what do you, you know, when you're sitting around with your project team, what do you want out of the project? I want a chance to work on my, um, my, uh, my CSS. Holy cow, I didn't even know you liked development. That's awesome. I, wow, why are you even on this project? You should be on this other project. Right? But until that person has a chance to say, like, 
this is what I want out of it. You don't know, you, don't, you have no idea what they're thinking about the whole project long, right? Whether this is, is meeting some sort of creative need they have or not. And so it's a super simple exercise, like what do you want out of it? And then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how can I make that happen for that person while we work together? Like it's, it's very basic. Um, so mentorship, feedback, goal setting at the start of a project, understanding people's ambitions, goals, you know, professional agenda. You know, somebody might be there and like, this is just a step to something else for them. And you don't know that. And so when it feels like, ah, man, just totally phoning it in, why don't they care? Maybe they don't. Maybe that's it. And maybe you need to, you know, talk to them about whatever the next thing is and scoot them that way. Because right now, you know, they're sort of poisoning the well and bringing, bringing things down for people. But you wouldn't know unless you talk to them about it. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. I won't belabor the point. So um, uh, last couple points I'll, I'll leave you guys with. Um, empathy is a practice for better design. Uh, good design connects people. We know that. Communication and, 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 and the framing of things. Um, but transformative design, the design that I think most of us want to do, um, that sort of moves people, that resonates, um, that builds on connections. You can't fake that. You can't force that. And, and it's, it's connections to inspire and motivate and instigate and um, provoke and delight. And I think that's what we want out of our work most of the time. You know, Not every project can give you that sort of feeling. But if that's what you're striving for, to, you know, to change people and to, to provide more than utility, you know, real value to, to whatever their, their lives are about, um, then you have to connect with them and, and, and in, in meaningful ways. And you have to understand, you know, their, their worldview. And for that moment that you're designing, at least, like, see it as your own. Um, and, you know, uh, that's the only way that you're going to make products and experiences and services worth a damn. Um, so that's it. Be excellent to each other. <laughs>